Hi, everyone. Welcome to Ask the Experts for Mitigating Risks with Insider Risk Management. My name is Katie Anderson. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Microsoft, and I am joined by two of our experts to talk to you about insider risk management today. I'll let them introduce themselves. Erin? Thanks, Katie. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Miyake. I'm a Product Manager working on insider risk management. Super excited to be here today with you all. And hi, folks. My name is Kevin Kirkpatrick. Uh, I work in the customer experience engineering team here, uh, helping uh, folks just like yourselves get deployed and, and get the most out of insider risk management. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron and Kevin, for being here today. Um, for those attending live, please feel free to drop your, your questions um, in, the, in the chat. Um, but we'll get started, and I'm going to actually lobby over an easy one to Aaron. Um, what is insider risk management? Good question, Katie. So Insider Risk Management, it's a solution within Microsoft Purview. Um, it helps organizations uh, identify and also investigate insider risks at their organization. A lot of organizations use this part of their data protection strategy, and they use it in tandem with other tools like DLP. So whereas um, DLP takes more of a data context and data pivot to help you with data protection, Insider Risk Management, which we'll talk about a bit more later helps with more of the user context to help identify those insider risks. Um, so also the solution, it's part of M365 E5, um, the compliance E5 add-on, and also the insider risk management standalone um, license. Awesome, thanks, Erin. And I think that one of the things you just said is super important to remember is that this is part of a holistic approach to data protection. This is a way for organizations to really help mitigate and identify those risks within their environment, right? And yeah. And Kevin, you work with customers every day mm -hmm. around insider risk management. Like what can you tell us about the data risks that customers are concerned about? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very interesting question because uh, when we are talking about data risk in general, right? There's there's many different avenues, but when we focus in on insider risk, um, we focus on a few areas here, and and of course we're we're uh, differentiated here because these are risks, right, that happen from the inside, not from the outside, uh, where you need to take a different approach. Um, within this area, um, what we eliminate and focus in on is is users here that are showing uh, data patterns here that are consistent with insider risk, and what this leads customers to finding is kind of this branched. Uh, aspect here of, of how uh, people will sometimes see inadvertent risk, um, where it's a, a well-meaning user here that's gone through and, and just been showing uh, patterns here and maybe uh, copying, maybe they've been copying their vacation photos and they ac accidentally have grabbed a few uh, company documents and, and, are, and are doing this as a normal process here, but not realizing they're not following the rules. Um, or malicious risk, right, which is uh, of course, something that uh, can be very, very costly to an organization uh, when someone is deliberately having approaches of, of moving data outside of an organization. Um, the other thing I just definitely want to point out here is uh, when we are actually looking through, this is incredibly common or more common than many organizations uh, initially consider. Um, I think there was a Carnegie Mellon uh, Scilab study last year that showed two thirds essentially of organizations uh, had at least five malicious incident uh, risk incidents uh, or malicious uh, types. Um, and and even more so on the on the um, on the inadvertent side. Um, and these tend to be very, very costly. So it's a, a super important problem and it's a great thing to hear that we're talking about here today. Right. So kind of what I'm hearing is that when we think about insider risk, there's really two areas. Like one is inadvertent. So mm -hmm. people, you know, taking data or accessing data in a way that really probably isn't supported by, by organizations and might put that data at risk. Um, and then malicious. So somebody deliberately downloading corporate data, potentially data exfiltrating it outside of the environment um, and using it in ways that can provide or, you know, mean a lot of risk for the organization. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's we have we have two different approaches. It really does take a human angle. So so as we go through and look at it, we provide a lot of investigative controls and and remediation types of actions. Um, you really have to look at each incident uh, on its own and determine what's the appropriate type of reaction within an organization. Right. 
And Erin, back to you. I know that one of the things that we always get asked is, how do I get started thinking about insider risk uh, management? How do I think about responding and mitigating these risks? Uh, what can you tell organizations that are really on this on this journey? Yeah, so I think trying to get started with insider risk, it can feel very overwhelming. It can be challenging for folks who are new on this journey. So we've tried to kind of break this down and take a three phase framework and how to think about getting started. So the first step is to understand your risk environment at your organization. So understand your data landscape, your insider risk landscape, and that includes, you know, how are the users at your organizations interacting with data? What type of data are they interacting with? Um, what types of interactions are they taking? Are they exfiltrating it? Um, are they downloading files from SharePoint? Are they largely using SharePoint online or, or other platforms? So having that grasp on what that looks like for your environment is important so that you can understand and build out your strategy on how you address your risky scenarios um, related to insider risk. The second step is building out you know, the policies to actually start detecting insider risk. And so what I mean by that is being able to define and configure the, the scenarios that you want to focus on, um, focus your detections on. And so for, for that, you know, understanding your environment obviously plays a huge part into being able to define those scenarios. And when I say scenarios, it's, it's like thinking about, you know, who are the users um, that you, you may want to focus on as well as any specific data. So you might have certain highly confidential projects uh, that you want to focus on. You might have certain data types, um, sensitive information types or labeled data that are important to you. And so um, being able to build out the policies to focus on those is important. And then finally, once you have those policies in place and you're detecting that risky activity, you know, it's very critical, obviously, to be able to triage and investigate that activity to determine if you need to take action on it. So, you know, to Kevin's point, he mentioned you might have benign activity. So sometimes um, users do activity that is part of their job or it's expected or maybe it's low impact. Um, so you might have folks that are in your sales team that are constantly emailing contracts to customers and that's expected activity. You might have folks that are, um, you know, emailing themselves vacation photos, personal stuff. Um, you need to be able to kind of, you know, investigate and, and review that the details of that activity to make that determination if it's something that needs to be acted upon um, and the risk that it might have on your organization. Great. That makes a lot of sense in terms of understanding the organizational needs and, and what's happening in your environment, uh, being able to set up policies so that they make sense for what your needs are and then being able to actually investigate those risks and figure out which ones are inadvertent or benign and which ones might be um, potentially a little bit more dangerous or a little bit more malicious for your organization. So follow-up question to that. I know that we're talking about insider risk management as part of Microsoft Purview as well. Um, how, how do you do those things with Microsoft Purview insider risk management? Yes, so insider risk management, we do have a number of features um, that allow and, and help customers walk through these, these steps. Um, all of these features, I'll walk through them, they all take a privacy first approach. Um, so the first one, understanding your organization and, and the environment. Um, that we have a, a feature called analytics. Uh, it's an awesome feature. Basically what it allows organizations to do is with just a quick turn of a toggle within 48 hours, we can generate a report um, with aggregated and anonymized insights. So this high level organizational view of um, insights about potential risky insider activity that's already taken place at your organization. So you can get this lens into where are the areas of risk that you know, I might need to focus on when I think about building my policies. So it's, it's really intended to allow you to understand what's happening holistically at your organization and use that to inform um, the next steps in terms of how you want to start to address those risks. So that's analytics. I think that if there's one thing that you take away from this, if you have the, the license that um, enables you to access insider risk management, just turn that toggle on and, and take a look at that report. Um, the next one is, is policies. And within insider risk management, we have a number of out-of-box customizable and configurable policy templates 
to allow you to start to define the types of risky activity that you want to detect at your organization um, based on you know, what makes sense for, for your unique needs as an organization. So within the policy templates, you can walk through a policy wizard. Uh, it's a pretty seamless process. You can select the users and the groups that you want to cover. You can select the types of activity that you want to focus on. Um, and then you can also, have, there's a number of customizability options within there so that you can really configure it to meet those unique needs for your organization. Because, uh, you know, I think we don't need to probably harp on this, but Insider Risk is definitely not a one size fits all challenge for folks. And so I think one thing that we've heard a lot from customers is the need to have this configurability and customizability um, features within their policies. And then, you know, finally, you create this policy and you're going to start to see alerts being detected. And so one thing that we've heard a lot from, from organizations and from customers is the importance of explainability when they're reviewing those alerts. So you open the alert and it's clear to you as the reviewer why this user has the alert, what was the activity that led to this alert being generated, um, where should you focus your investigation and triage uh, time first, which are the activities that you know, might be popping as riskier than the others. And so within Insider Risk Management, in the alert review experience, there's a number of features that can help you with this triage and review process so that you can start to quickly get into that level of detail that you might need to, um, you know, as we talked about earlier and Kevin alluded to earlier, is this something that's benign? Um, is this something that may be expected activity or, you know, is this unexpected activity that involves some very sensitive files that we need to quickly take action on and, um, you know, further investigate? Um, so those are a few of the features within uh, the solution that can help walk help customers walk through those those few steps. Awesome. Oh, and uh, Kevin, I, I definitely yes. want your input more on this too. I also want to yeah. hone in on the fact that like insider risk management has privacy built in, privacy by design as well. So all of those things that you mentioned, we also very much take a privacy uh, by design approach. Um, things that include uh, username pseudonymization so that you know we can make sure to protect the identities of people if they're being investigated as part of um, which is on by default and and hard uh, our back controls to make sure that only the right people within a security team or within the investigation group have access to seeing all this types of data. So um, I think that that's the uh, breakdown was really great. So thank you, Aaron. Kevin, you work with customers yeah. all the time. What do you have to add to that? Yeah, just so to add on to this a little bit. So one of the biggest myths I think is like how difficult it is to, to get started. Um, starting from what Katie said, by the way, um, everything is off by default. So this is something that really, you know, fundamentally, uh, there's nothing that's defaultly turned on or anything that you're um, to be concerned about from that perspective. Everything is, is shut down and set into the most private stance by default. And that's kind of where uh, our methodology is where we sit. And uh, however, um, when comparing this, I think uh, I talked to a lot of organizations and there's almost this, this myth that this is such a big problem or this will take so much work that I'm going to have to go through a very lengthy onboarding process and I won't be able to do this with my really stripped down IT team where I really am working through tons of priorities at the same time. This is definitely something that we make it approachable to get started. You can kind of do a, a crawl, walk, run type of strategy and get going quickly. So just, you know, doubling down on the analytics that, that Aaron was mentioning, it's a very quick option, right? There's no infrastructure needs to be deployed. Essentially, um, a couple of button clicks in, in our, you know, cloud hosted service here, and, and you will have an ongoing report of the last 10 days of activity, uh, what's going on in your environment. And it's, it just helps you from getting started period of just how to get it to capture and view what, uh, what is going on in just an overall perspective and, and how to get, get going at this. Even when we're going through and deploying policies, we've tuned the tool in a way that it's simple to make quick decisions and get started and just start to gain some visibility, but granular enough that you can really tune in your, your policies and alerts to really meet your particular organizational uh, needs. And, and almost every organization you start with setting up a, 
a default set of things that you think that this might be interesting. Here, I'll build up a, a policy based off of the scenario that I'm concerned about. And then, and then I go a little bit more uh, granular over time, start to tune those, those alerts, remove things that are less concerned to me, uh, highlight things that are higher concern to me, um, maybe identify new areas where, where my organization has crown jewels that I want to go through and define and, and, um, and highlight those concerns more than, than others. So um, just really want to encourage everyone that this is uh, approachable and something you can get started with very, very rapidly. Awesome. And I kind of want to hark on one of the things you just said, Kevin, and talk a little bit about extensibility, because I think one of the things that, um, you know, is is something that we hear from customers is, are you just for Microsoft? And, mm. and that's definitely something that we are not. Like the fact that analytics, um, you know, will get signals from across not just your M365 tenant, but from your Windows N devices, as well as Mac um, is really cool. I also think that some of the announcements we recently made about integrations with Microsoft Defender for cloud apps is really key. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to, about that or some of the other announcements that just came from Microsoft uh, around insider risk management? Yeah, in terms of looking at the the recent innovations, and I'll say that you know we're we're in one thing I will say is this solution in general is very fast moving. So continuously be watching our blogs. Um, we have great things to announce every. Uh, every chunk of time here about um, about uh, recent extensions here. Uh, Defender for Cloud Apps, essentially we want to make sure that um, we're able to, to highlight risk uh, in your organization wherever it's best detected, essentially. Um, so if we look at it overall in, in perspective, uh, inside of risk management, it's, it's generally working off of things that are already audited via other mechanisms and, and, and um, pulling together a dashboards of, of really just um, on a per user basis here where where you're showing people that have uh, the most um, uh, the highest risk patterns. Uh, so when we're looking from an extensibility perspective, uh, we're looking at what other systems we can get at. Uh, Defender for Cloud Apps, right? We can see many third party applications. We can go through and see um, activities that happen and, and those those really kind of plug into uh, some security policy templates that we actually have in the Insider Risk Management solution. One of the other big extensibility areas that that really help organizations find this, um, generally the beginning of when you start looking at insider risk is, is understanding users that are leaving an organization and the ability to bring in um, indications of people that are leaving your organization is something that's incredibly helpful for identifying uh, when uh, the most common uh, patterns of insider risk happen. Um, so this is something that's been built in as well for, for years. I know this wasn't something that was a recent innovation that we added on, uh, but this is something that uh, is a, definitely something you should look at doing in terms of have a set of uh, configuration steps of how do I go through and bring in my, my HR uh, indications. Other things to just keep in mind, um, if you go to aka.ms slash our insider risk manage, I'm sorry, insider risk blog, um, uh, you'll see the latest innovations of what we've kind of come out. Um, the biggest one that I think I was excited about is that um, uh, from an analytics perspective, uh, we actually are extending the capabilities of that. So now it's not only a place you go in the beginning to look and see what, what patterns of risk are happening in your organization, but now um, that same information is helping you as you're defining inside of risk management policies to help show you thresholds that make sense for you. Uh, so when you're going through and deciding, hey, I'm concerned about users that are taking USB files, or taking files and taking them from a device and moving them to a USB drive, um, that you can see what's normal across the users that are going through and, and regularly interacting with their um, uh, in that same way and, and setting policies that are appropriate in that way. Um, so that's a, a few things to kind of look out for. Um, I don't know if there's any other uh, ones to highlight right now. I kind of want to focus a little bit more on the just overall what is inside of risk management and the, just the, the product and the um, uh, capabilities in general. But yeah. super excited. We've got new innovations all the time coming out. Agreed. Yeah, we certainly keeps me on the product marketing side busy. So uh, super appreciate the, the speed at which we're coming out with great new features to make it easier for, for admins to, to help, you know, fine tune their systems. 
Um, one of the things that we did announce too is uh, sequence detection within analytics mm. and really understanding that user context. And I know Aaron that on the engineering side, you work really hard on, on that. So what can you tell me about user context and, and getting more of that visibility? Next. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think that, you know, we, we talked about it earlier, we alluded to it in terms of, you know, when you think about DLP, you get this data pivot. In insider risk management, you see this user context. So to expand a little bit on what we mean by the user context, if you think about insider risk, um, a lot of user, you know, these are users who already have, uh, you know, access in your organization. And rightfully so, they're employees, they're vendors. And so a lot of the activity that they're doing, uh, copying things to the cloud perhaps, or emailing externally, this might be part of their normal day-to-day -day job. And so to, to, to detect the risk um, in this activity and find that needle in the haystack, it's important to have the user context. So understand how all of these events correlate together to start to highlight potential motive and intent. So I'll give a quick example of the sequence detection what it does is it basically correlates across individual activities performed by a user because they're related, um, because they, they involve the same file. So let's say that I am downloading a bunch of uh, files from a highly confidential SharePoint site related to a top secret project. Um, I'm about to leave the company. I'm going to a competitor. I want to take these with me. So I download them from a SharePoint, but I want to obfuscate the sensitivity of those files to try to fly under the radar. So I rename all those files, you know, Aaron's vacation itinerary, Aaron's family photos, things that look benign. <clears throat> However, I proceed to exfiltrate them. Let's say I copy them to a USB, my personal USB, and then I delete the files from my machine because I wanna cover my tracks. And, and all of this, when you are able to see all of these activities stitched together that I'm performing in a sequence on these files, that are coming from a highly confidential SharePoint, you start to see and uncover this intent and this motive. And so this is where, you know, having this user context, this pattern that I'm performing with these files is super helpful in being able to triage and make that quick decision, like Kevin was talking about earlier, like this is not, you know, benign. This looks like something that needs to be investigated further. And so the intent is really pull that user context together to you know, really minimize that time to action for your security team, for your insider risk team, so that you can quickly manage that risk and contain it before it becomes a problem, before I'm already out the door and I've started my new job at a competitor. Great. Thank you for that, Erin. That, that really helps explain what user context really means. Um, and one of the things you just talked about is how it's insider risk management is part of data protection. Um, and Kevin, I know one of the big questions we get a lot of the time is what is the difference between insider risk management and DLP? What can you tell us about that? It's it's true because <laughs> data loss prevention has has existed for a good amount of time. This is what, uh, something that's kind of a, a known, um, and by the way, I'm not taking away anything from data loss prevention. This is something that's absolutely key in organizations for for stopping known exfiltration uh, patterns. And, and what I've really uh, seen from a, it's a prevention prevention aspect here. So it's, you know, I've often seen this uh, described as keeping the good users good, right? In terms of uh, providing nudges and in ways of saying, hey, if I was not meaning to do this here, here's something that I can warn a user or, or, or stop something that's, that's um, already happening. But, um, but from a zero trust methodology here, we have to take a different frame of mind when we're going through and looking at insider risk management. Um, in uh, From a data loss prevention perspective, you're looking at a bunch of events in, in isolation and often highlighting particular exfiltration events in, in, in uh, isolation. And what you really miss is the, is the whole story and that holistic view uh, from a user-centric point of view. Insider risk management is much more personal. You need to really look at that user's history and the types of behavior that's actually happening in order to make the right decision uh, as an organization, because this this tends to be something where that that decision you're making with that user is, is critical. So, um, so that's one very important pivot here is that in data loss prevention, we're often showing event by event and we're looking at particular activities that have happened uh, with uh, insider risk management 
we are putting our pivot directly on the users. So when we have an alert, it's specific to a user in your organization. And um, it's meant to go through and just paint a picture of, of what risk patterns here were, were seen to be um, something that was that was needing a, an investigative look of this. Um, what we're not doing is going through and interacting with the user in that sort of way. We're leaving this to you. Um, provide a workflow of how to go through and look at individual incidents uh, with you know uh, suggestions and ways you could start to mitigate. But it's not something that's 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 interfering or putting a block in place or anything like that. I think it's it's very important here that we're much more looking at a longer period of time uh, and looking for patterns here that, that might be more concerning. And like Aaron mentioned, a perfect example of that is our sequences of saying, you know, uh, one event in isolation is not bad, but if I've gone through and seen a pattern of someone downloading, uh, obfuscating, then exfiltrating or something like that, all in, in a, with the exact same file, um, we just have a lot more information to work with and a lot more uh, ability to go through and understand what the, the context was of the, of the alert. And kind of on that note, one of the questions that we just got um, is how long is the evidence of possible exfiltration kept in the cloud? Um, you know, in, in terms of how do security teams keep that and retain that data? Um, Kevin, I don't know if you're the, yeah, pass it to you. <laughs> yeah. So how long is, how long do we hold on to it for? Um, so we have a, uh, we'll respond Bond here, we actually have a support article that goes through and talks about our retention uh, retention times on, on a per uh, basis. Um, I think currently from uh, from just the alert perspective, I've gone through and seen, seen something. Um, uh, there's retention limits of about 120 days or so. Um, the I, I think when we're looking in greater context here, the, the idea is if I've gone through and I've actually found something that's very, very important, right? To the point where I've gone through and created an insider risk management case for it, and I'm really holding on to it. Um, that there is is held for as long as you actually need for the for the investigative process. But um, but from this perspective, I think of, uh, you know, we're, there's not a inherent other hold, I think, involved. Uh, Aaron, anything to add on top of that? Yeah, no, I, I want to, I think, also kind of chime in and talk about when we talk about these end-to-end -end investigation flows that are within insider risk management. So as you're reviewing these alerts that are surfacing risky activity, some of those will require additional investigation. Mm -hmm. Of those that require additional investigation, the most egregious and serious ones, which you know is not gonna be the majority of them, it's just gonna be probably few and far between, those ones you might need to escalate for like a legal investigation. And so there is, yeah. Uh, functionality within insider risk management where you can escalate an insider risk management case to e-discovery and the legal team can take over the investigation. Um, and at that point, you know, I think it kind of turns into a different type of investigation workflow within um, most likely like the legal department at your organization. Um, and so that's, that's another kind of part of this end to end investigation functionality within insider risk management. That's a great call out. Thank you, Kevin and Aaron for that. Um, final question, and then I want to make sure we wrap up and have uh, some resources available. Um, using IRM policies um, and, and DLP policies, how do you use those in tandem? Um, how, how do those complement each other and how do you um, execute so you have both the DLP policies and insider risk management policies? Yeah, so I'll, I'll keep this pretty short. So. Um, uh, spot on with the, the question here that data loss prevention policies here. Uh, I think in general, you mentioned that, yeah, I can work off of uh, high severity alerts here from, from the DLP perspective uh, at this point right now. Uh, data loss prevention is kind of an input point of where we can start looking at something because of a high severity event in, in data loss prevention. Um, we are always interested in looking for new ways to weave in and, and build this out. I think one um, thing we just recently talked about is how we start to look at, at patterns of activity that have happened in data loss prevention, uh, sorry, in insider risk management, and then use that to highlight uh, often process gaps and things like that, that, that you can go through and, and provide uh, more corrective controls in uh, data loss prevention, really providing more abilities to help stop with inadvertent risk. Um, so, um, yeah. But yeah, a great question. 
And I think we're out of time. I want to thank you both for coming uh, to ask the experts. Um, if you're an E3 uh, customer right now and want to experience insider risk management for yourself, check out aka.ms slash purview trial. Um, we also have some great resources about getting started with insider risk management at our Become an Insider Risk Management Ninja page, which is at aka.ms slash insider risk ninja. Um, thanks all for joining us today. Appreciate the time.